Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Climate Action Through Fiber, Textile Exchanges Climate Plus and Regenerative Wool. Today's presentation will be recorded and sent out to all registered participants and also will be posted on the Hub. We will have a Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions into the question box on the webinar doc. Any unanswered questions will be answered afterward via email. Now on to Sevilla with Textile Exchange. Sevilla? Thanks, Rose, and welcome to today's webinar. We always read our antitrust statement at the top of any meeting that Textile Exchange holds. Textile Exchange convenes the textile community and values diversity of views, expertise, opinions, backgrounds, and experiences. It's expected that members of this community will collaborate by sharing ideas, information, and resources of publicly available information only, and avoid discussions on price, strategic plans, or other private and sensitive information. Today's webinar is Climate Action Through Fiber, Textile Exchange's Climate Plus Strategy, and how regenerative wool can play a valuable part in that. Today's presenters, we have Shona Quinn, who's the Director of Social Consciousness with Eileen Fisher. We have Jennifer Cooper, who's the Vice President of Native Energy, our own Hannah Dennis, Senior Manager of Standards with Textile Exchange, and myself, Sylvia granger Yovakini, Program and Project Strategist. So, uh, you may remember that at last year's conference in Vancouver, Textile Exchange rolled out the concept of our new Climate Plus strategy. And we've been working over the last year to evolve this strategy and develop it into a full uh, program. You may be familiar with our mission, Textile Exchange inspires and equips people to accelerate sustainable practices in the textile value chain. We focus on minimizing the harmful impacts of the global textile industry and maximizing its positive effects. We envision a global textile industry that protects and restores the environment and enhances lives. And today's webinar is gonna be focusing specifically on that vision and how we can all make progress towards it. So in 2016, Qantas determined that our industry emits 3,300 3, million metric tons of carbon dioxide, which is 6.7% of total global emissions. So clearly we have some work to do. Each phase of textile product production plays a different part, but the fiber production stage all the way on the left produces 15% or 1% of total global emissions. We're gonna look at ways that we can address a part of this challenge using wool. Textile exchange is focusing specifically on the fiber production part of our industry's carbon footprint. And while we may be focusing on this area, we work in concert with many other partner organizations to address the other parts of this puzzle and address the impacts of our collective actions. So we've looked at the climate part and what does the plus stand for? Amplifying positive impacts in soil health, water and biodiversity, which together are necessary to sustain life on our planet. So it's worth taking a moment to review why we've established such an aggressive target as 35 to 45%. It really comes down to what is required to avoid widespread and irreversible climate effects on our planet, which is identified by the IPCC as limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius of atmospheric warming. Just to give some context to these irreversible effects, when you compare the projected effects of two degrees versus 1.5 degree, degrees, we're looking at two to three times the effect on biodiversity. So for example, species loss in vertebrates at 1.5 degrees is only 4%, but at two, two degrees is twice as bad. Same with species loss in plants, it goes from 8% to 16%. And with species loss in insects, it's three times worse. So clearly, even though it seems like half a degree difference, it doesn't sound like much, the effects globally on, on us are incredibly important. So to do our part to help address this challenge for our collective industry, Textile Exchange is evolving our strategy. From our founding in 2004 to 2020, we have focused on raising awareness of sustainability issues, educating the industry, establishing standards that work to verify and support the adoption of a portfolio of preferred fibers and materials. We collect data via our benchmark program. We publish reports on preferred fiber and material production and consumption. We are a safe and, su safe and supportive pre-competitive space where a broad range of industry stakeholders can work together towards our collective goals. And we'll be moving towards accelerating that adoption. We are going to, as opposed to educating and growing the industry, we're now leading the industry. We're offering comprehensive preferred fiber and material guidance. 
leading problem solving across an entire portfolio. Uh, we, we offer data-rich communications, measuring, benchmarking, and driving preferred fiber evolution. We're working in partners with other, with other organizations and also helping businesses evolve their business models to improve and enhance their models to shift focus to ROI squared, natural cost accounting, and the triple bottom line. So Climate Plus strategy will require decarbonization of feedstocks, use of materials with lower carbon dioxide emissions and footprints on their, on their production or extraction, conservation of nature and a healthy ecosystem to absorb and lock away carbon from the atmosphere and into plants and soils. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. But looking ahead, we're also helping support our industry to transition to a circular business model and reducing consumption, shifting to service models, for example reducing production of virgin materials and displacement of virgin materials by secondary reclaimed or recycled material feedstocks. So when we look at the, you'll recall from our earlier slide that textile exchange is focusing specifically on fiber production part of our industry's carbon footprint. Each fiber will have different challenges and opportunities based on its unique production factors. Today we're going to look at a great solution to mitigate the climate effects of wool production in the field. So as you can see on the chart on the, on the left, carbon needs to focus on field to bale section. Polyester, will look at oil and gas to amorphous PET pellets. Man-made cellulosic is focusing on wood to regenerative cellulose. But in wool, what we're looking at today, we're looking at the field specifically. Each fiber has its own area of challenge that it will be focusing on. So from our baseline 2019 emissions, wool was 9% of the overall material uh, emissions. Now the fiber volume was according to our benchmark program and we don't have all the data but we only have the ones that are reported to us to our benchmark program was 1,070,000 tons. And while that's only 1% of the total volume, it counts for 9% of the greenhouse gases. So clearly we have some work to do. Now if we look at all the fibers total together, business as usual, uh, totaling 845 million tons. If we want to reduce it 35%, that means bringing it down to 397. If we want to reduce it 45%, that means bringing it down to 336 million tons. That's by 2030. We have our work cut out for us. So if we only use preferred cotton, that brings it down a little bit. If we also combine that with 75% recycled polyester, that brings it down a little bit more. If we combine those, we can start to see some significant savings. You see where I'm headed with this. And if we start to look at a portfolio approach using all preferred fibers in significant portions, we can really start to make progress, bringing those numbers down. But clearly we have an innovation gap. Now, the reduction that we see here, this is based on today's reasonable expectations of aggressive substitution but we're going to have to come up with some better solutions and we're going to look today at one of the great solutions that the wool industry can use and it's one lever that it can use to make progress towards its climate solutions. So if we look at the total usage of wool, uh, the greenhouse gas score of virgin wool from sheep had an MSI score of 30.3 Recycled wool, significantly lower at 2.94. However, recycled wool is only a small percentage, only 2% of the total usage. So clearly there's a lot of progress that we could be making in recycled. And over to you, Hannah, do you wanna talk about other ways that wool can, we can use wool and look at different ways of uh, mitigating the climate risks of wool? Yes, thank you, Sevilla. I'm going to just share a little bit of information about the work that we have been doing in textile exchange with wool. And this has largely been focused around the responsible wool standard. And I will also give a, a brief introduction to what some of the next steps will be for our work on wool and other animal fibers as we move into the delivery of the Climate Plus strategy. So the Responsible Wool Standard is a voluntary global standard that addresses animal welfare, land management, and social welfare on farms. It was launched in 
2016 and we've seen very strong adoption. I think we now have uh, close to a, a thousand farms certified across the wool producing regions. You want to shift to the next slide, Svea? Um, the goals of the Responsible Wool Standard are to provide the industry with a tool to recognize the best practices of farmers to ensure that wool comes from farms with a progressive approach to managing their land. So the land management module of the RWS addresses the soil health, the grazing practices, biodiversity, as well as fertilizer and pesticide use where applicable. It takes a practice-based approach to land management rather than an outcome-based approach and it sets a, a, a threshold and then a continuous improvement approach. Uh, with regards to animal welfare, uh, the RWS takes a very comprehensive approach and sets the, the bar for performance very high. There are prohibited practices, for example, mulesing is not permitted there are also restricted, restricted practices, so certain husbandry procedures that are permitted, but uh, there are conditions in how they're performed. But there's also a large number of requirements that are there to ensure that the animals have good welfare. And uh, with version two of the RWS, we also have introduced a set of social welfare criteria, recognizing that sustainability is a, a holistic uh, topic. Uh, like all textile exchange standards, the RWS is a full chain of custody standard using the, the, the content claim standard for the, um, the chain of custody requirements. And last but not least, it, the aim of the standard is to be a benchmark through the standard setting uh, process. Uh, we establish a threshold as well as a common understanding of what responsible practices mean uh, in practice and then the standard can be used to recognize and reward existing good practice as well as to be that driver for change where where it is needed. So um, if you want to move to the next slide Sevilla. As I mentioned previously we take a practice-based approach to land management but in the updated version we are starting to capture information on on the specific climate beneficial grazing practices that are being utilized, as well as if carbon measurements are being taken. And uh, we're really looking forward to learning more about the practices that are in place so that we can identify how we can best support the developments to further the adoption of regenerative grazing practices as well as to recognize and reward the pioneers that are demonstrating what can be done. So I thought I'd just include a couple of examples of, of farmers that we have come across in our journey with the RWS. So we, we know from this work that we're, we're lucky to have amazing, amazingly progressive groups like OBIS21 in our network, and we'll hear more about them and from Ricardo later in this webinar. Uh, and uh, another example is uh, Brett Walker um, in South Africa, who you can see in the slide here, who uh, farms sheep and angora goats. And he's grown up farming holistically before him. His mother has been uh, farming for I think, 25 years using holistic management practices. So it's not always new, new things. It's just recognizing these existing practices that, that farmers are, are already using. And another farmer I just wanted to, to highlight in this context, uh, move to the next slide, Sevilla, is Jeannie Carver from Imperial Stock Ranch. She was actually our, our very first RWS certified uh, farm back in 2016. Uh, she has now launched the Chanico Wool Company Carbon Initiative, which is measuring its producers carbon sequestration through a combination of soil and bio-based sampling, lab analysis and modeling. Um, this project started this year and based on conservative estimates the three ranches that are currently participating are pulling approximately 660,000 tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere each year. So this is a, a, a really really interesting initiative that we're keen to support. But if you move to the next slide, we can 
take a look at what, what our plans are for, for next step, both in terms of the standard, but also more broadly in textile exchange. Sevilla, if you can move to the next slide. There we go. Thank you. So as Sevilla mentioned, uh, the, the data clearly demonstrates the opportunity with wool, not just to reduce impact, but also restore and have a positive impact. And in, in the light of that, we, we recognize the need to really do more to support the adoption of climate beneficial grazing practices. So within the RWS and the RMS and our other land-based uh, standards, we will continue the work of collecting and aggregating information on regenerative grazing practices on all our certified farms and use this as a starting point to explore how we can better uh, support this work. And also linked to this, we are, are working on our strategy for the wool, mohair and alpaca roundtables on how we can also use these roundtables to, to support this shift in the industry, how to bring more people on board and how to recognize and reward the, the people that are, are doing this really important work. So I hope if you're interested that you will plan to join the upcoming roundtable meetings where we will be discussing this in more detail. Thank you very much. And hi everyone, thank you Hannah. Um, and thanks to everyone that's joining. I, I would like to just recognize that um, these are particularly challenging times right now from a social perspective, a economic perspective, a political and environmental perspective. It feels like a perfect storm. And, um, uh, you know, each individual is holding a lot right now, and uh, I hope that you and your families are doing okay, and, and thanks for carving out this time, because time is precious right now, to join us and, and learn more about this regenerative ag project. For those of you that aren't familiar with Eileen Fisher, um, we're a privately held design company, 40% employee owned, and a, a benefit uh, corporation. So what that means is a business that places value on creating positive impact for society and the environment in addition to making a profit. So for us, uh, design really matters and we use that word design in any way you can think about it. Uh, we're very intentional, intentional about how we make our products, uh, simple shapes, made to last, always comfortable. And it's clothing that can be combined and recombined uh, again and again. So we refer to it as the line as a system. For fashion, you know, fashion can, can represent a short mindset, a short term mindset. But for us, we are doing our best to try and transcend time um, and create products that last five, 10, 20 years, and then ask for that product back when you're done with it. We take a very holistic view on a life cycle from the field to the end of life and back around again. And when it comes to materials, we're using mostly natural fibers, sourcing the highest quality and, and, and any sustainable fibers that we're getting our hand, we can get our hands on, we're trying to do that. We tend to ask two very basic questions over and over again. And that is, where is this product coming from and where is it going? You can go to the next slide, please. Um, so Horizon 2030, this is a, a way of building off of our sustainable progress that we've already made. And we know we are coming up short in some areas. So filling in those gaps and yet trying to do our best to go further faster. And we're trying to move our focus from limiting the neg negative impacts to leaving areas in a better place than how we found them. There's five key areas that we focus on around um, Horizon 2030 strategy. 
And that's choosing circles over lines. So that idea of moving away from linear thinking of the take make waste model to a circular one that reuses and replenishes the resources involved. Uh, two examples of that for us are our Renew program and our Waste No More program. Thriving communities, you know, we know we can't do this without um, focusing on worker well-being. We need a healthy and, and vibrant workforce, workforce, both within um, our corporation, our business, and in our supply chain. Empowering women, I think those of you that know Eileen Fisher has always taken a, a great interest in gender equality and supporting women. And we're also trying to find opportunities between that gender equality um, and environmental sustainability intersection. So that's an area that we're working on. And fibers, uh, fibers materials have also always been a priority for us. So two areas of focus is regenerative agriculture and fiber recycling. And the last one is around climate. Our climate strategy is focused on three areas. One, innovations uh, within the product life cycle, which as you can imagine includes a lot from the very beginning to the end. And collective action, making sure our voice is heard with others for policy and other issues, and the role of women. How, again, do we think about lifting women up, empowering, engaging to um, build a healthier world? Next slide, please. Great. So Native Energy. Um, we've been partnering with Native Energy for about nine years as a carbon offset provider. And we've supported some amazing projects through those years. Uh, and we've also been talking about how we might develop an insetting project, something that was within our supply chain. Then about three years ago, um, Eileen Fisher committed to science-based targets for carbon. And in making this uh, commitment, it made us even more interested in developing a project within our supply chain. And we were also inspired by what we were seeing other companies do, like Ben and & Jerry's and Cliff Bar. So, um, there, and there were two main reasons that we invested in this project that we're talking about. One is we wanted to help expand regenerative farm, farming. We think it's so important as part of this climate portfolio um, by investing in our partners' networks and helping to remove any financial barriers or any barriers a farmer might have to shift to regenerative. And we were also interested in the science and supporting our claims around climate action. Um, trying to or thinking about how do we connect the dots between the animal and the land and where the carbon is being sequestered. And finally, in, in 2019, the pieces started to come together for us and we found a connection between our product, climate, and the communities within our supply chain. Um, our wool partner in Argentina, Ovis 21, was interested in the idea and the plan is that this program will kick off in the spring of next year, uh, starting with four farms. So we invite you to join us uh, because there is so much more strength in uh, collaborative projects uh, to move the work for fast, further faster. Um, so what I'd like to do is just share, a, if it works, we'll see how the technology goes, share a two minute video um, that we created that tells a bit of the story um, down in Argentina. And then I'm gonna pass it over to Jennifer who's gonna share a bit more of the details around this project.
Sevilla, you might have to unmute. Doing more than business, they are helping to make the world better. When you buy wool from Eileen Fisher, you're supporting regenerative farmers, farmers who love the land, farmers who are using progressive practices to draw down carbon, to restore the ecosystems of Patagonia. The sheep, they're actually regenerating the environment and they're a vital component to greater biodiversity, better habitat for wildlife, better well-being for farmers, and what at some point was considered the problem, sheep are actually are providing an incredible solution. You see the change, so you can't deny it's, ha it's happening because you see there's more grass, the grass is healthier. Pienso que tenemos una responsabilidad tremenda en transmitirle a, a nuestros hijos, a nuestros clientes, a nuestros amigos, eh, cuál es la, la mejor forma de trabajar con los animales, ser gentil con los animales, pero cómo ser gentil con la tierra. Y lo estoy pudiendo pasar también a, a los chicos que están en los corrales, a Pelín, y que ellos a su vez puedan volcarlo a otra gente en el futuro. That idea of doing business while doing good is something that needs to grow and be an epitome of, in, in all the world. Great. Um, thank you, Shona, for sharing that. Um, that's a great, great footage of the people working the land and really, for me, emphasizes the point that this is a great climate solution, but it's ultimately about so, so, so much more than, than the carbon, the climate. It's only one small piece. Um, so at Native Energy, we believe in taking action on climate and for the past 20 years we've been working with companies to find a way to bring money up front to communities and people reducing and removing carbon so we focus on the nexus between very high carbon gains and complex barriers to taking that action to realize those gains so in that way we work with companies to make change in their supply base change that is not happening at the pace and scale that our communities and our climate need so today we're talking about regenerative agriculture practices and this amazing partnership with Eileen Fisher, with wool growers in Argentina and with the leaders at Ovis 21. Um, as Shona shared, wool growers in Argentina and Eileen Fisher are doing amazing work and have been for some time. Building on that, um, in light of Eileen Fisher's science-based targets and, and climate goals, we stop to take a look at whether additional investments would accelerate and expand on that amazing work. Whether we could capture precise, robust data on carbon gains in the process. So not just annually, but reliably over decades. So to matter, regenerative practices need to be the norm and, and long, be long-term. So this approach of investing to cause carbon gains within the supply base is one way and there are many, many ways, but investing to cause carbon gains in the supply base is one way to help scale the transformation to regenerative agriculture. It can help because monetizing the total carbon benefit can finance the initial transformation, while the lasting myriad of so many other benefits for growers, farmers, are what sustain that transformation over time. And regenerative practices are so multi multifaceted in their benefits. So to all the things that matter, communities, livelihoods, our ecosystems, um, yet so few of today's farms are regenerative. Um, of course, each farm faces really different circumstances and it is by talking to each farm, each family in many cases, we find that sometimes, in some instances, it is financial support that will tip the balance. 
and financial support that comes early and upfront can enable or accelerate adoption. So adoption of what exactly? Um, well, regenerative practices include grazing more animals on smaller plots of grasses, moving the animals, then allowing long periods of rest for the grasses on those plots before the sheep return to graze them again. That's what enables the roots to go really deep and pull that carbon deeper into the soil. Um, to do this, farmers often need specialized fencing to keep the sheep on one plot for a time and then move that fencing and those animals to another plot for a time, as well as movable water troughs or piping. In some cases, financing the cost of that fencing, those water systems is what will scale the number of farms able to transition. All of this happens first and foremost at kitchen tables, <laughs> at the kitchen table where the farms are in the lead and identify the regenerative practices they're interested in and willing to adopt or expand. How many hectares uh, split into how many plots, grazed and rested for how many days in a season and other decisions like this. It's farms that also identify the financing and the informational support education that they expect they will need to make this happen in a given period um, or soon <laughs> in, these in the case of trying to move more quickly on this transformation. So with this information in hand, with this plan for new pra grazing practices, um, one can model how much carbon will accrue in soils if the farms adopt those practices. And it's this modeled amount of carbon accruals, then duly discounted, that can be pre-purchased by companies that source farms from the region. So in that way, those companies are investing their climate, community, ecosystem, or other program budgets to finance a transition to regenerative, specifically with the farms that are stalled. Um, and Hannah mentioned there are um, farms who are have been able to make this transition and are on the path to doing so, which is fantastic. Um, you know, what about those ones that are stuck, stalled, or otherwise not able to move forward in that way? Um, so in turn, for all of that, the farms contractually agree to implement those practices and critically to maintain those practices over an agreed number of decades. Grazing practices are reported annually and carbon gains are measured every three years, again over decades. And I make this point over decades because it's not common to all regenerative programs. So all regenerative practices that improve soil health are good for the climate in some manner, to some extent. And for many companies, knowing that is all they, that they need. For other companies, those that have set quantitative climate goals and ambitions for carbon neutral or net zero, it's necessary to have a robust protocol in place that not only measures soil carbon gains, but has mechanisms in place to ensure permanence and to address reversals. So for those companies, a program in which farmers join in a given year, potentially need to step back in another, um, and there's a lot of flux, that does not necessarily support the climate the climate claims and carbon gains that, that they require. And just a note, at current projections, this regenerative wool for climate project will pull over 100,000 tons of carbon from the atmosphere and into the soils, which represents nearly 10% of the industry's wool footprint in the year 2019, the million and 70,000 tons that Sevilla shared earlier in her slides. Um, and this is starting small. So the work going on now to expand the project involve more farms um, and reach half a million tons of carbon, making an even larger step toward meeting textile exchanges climate plus goals before 2030. So back to the farms with these long-term agreements in place, farms receive the financing up front. They do not have to wait three or four years for soil carbon accruals, nor take on risks associated with waiting for those soil carbon accruals. They're paid for implementing practices in year one. This catalyzes the transition with farmers, growers, ranchers, who cannot otherwise invest up front. but it is the lasting benefits for those growers that sustain that transition over time. 
um, in the form of reduced costs for inputs, um, such as forage. So in times of the year when there's not quite as much grasses for the animals under a conventional model, forage needs to be purchased. That's reduced um, improved animal health and improved nutrient density of the grasses. More dent dent drought tolerant grasses and productivity gains are all of the things combined that sustain this transition. So it's really about getting over that initial hurdle. The carbon finance or other finance is not needed indefinitely, nor are premiums part of such a model. Um, so th the additional value of ecosystem services is multitude of other benefits um, sustain these practices. So these are the benefits that Shona was talking about, Eileen Fisher focuses on textile exchange, are all emphasizing that, that this is so much more than, than just climate. Um, looking at these examples, regenerative practices lead to the reintroduction of native grasses, which are more drought tolerant and provide native habitat for insects and birds and other wildlife. Um, the native grasses, once grazed intensively and then left to rest and regrow, are more nutrient dense. And also with animals grazed closely together in plots, waterways are protected as those animals are no longer able to trample riparian zones in search of a drink or some mud. Um, streams remain protected from the sediment runoff that occurs when riparian zones are trampled into muddy banks, preserving stream ecosystems and stream bed habitats. And interestingly, we're also finding regenerative grazing can help animals relearn how to group together to bunch up better protecting themselves from predators, which is a significant concern and an economic hit for many farmers and ranchers. Um, for this particular regenerative wool for climate program, next steps include um, highlighting the role of women. So the program provides education, technical support to the farms, and ongoing, as well as ongoing measurement and verification in the field. Um, and we are focused on the role and involvement of women in each of these areas as we move forward. So while climate may be the catalyst, there are many, many more important reasons to take this action. You hear that in Eileen Fisher's goals, which are so much more than climate, and you hear it in the plus in Textile Exchange's Climate Plus goal. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to you, Sevilla. Thank you so much. Jennifer and Shauna, really interesting project you guys are up to. And we have some very interesting questions coming up. I want to take the last question that came in first because it actually is very relevant for what Jennifer was just talking about. The question, it's a multi-part question. I'm going to read the whole thing first. So Jennifer, keep in mind, we'll loop back and break this down into parts because it's a good one. Can you talk more about the math and science behind the carbon sequestration estimates? Do we feel we have enough long-term data to do so accurately? Do we think there is a carbon sequestration plateau? Do we take that into account? What sort of policies do you put in place to ensure permanence? Interesting program, thanks. So these are big questions and obviously, I just wanna say right off the bat, <clears throat> whenever questions like this come up addressing, for example, LCA data or math and science behind these long-term projections, I just want to say we could only go on the best data that we have at the time and we can't let the fact that that data may not be perfect get in the way of our progress. So as when Textile Exchange started in 2004, we had a much more limited understanding than we do today. So, but, but we didn't let, the organization did not let that stop us from making progress. So of course, over time, as information and data comes in and gets better, we're able to evolve and shift our practices, our knowledge, our program, our strategies accordingly. But you, you can't let perfect get in the way of the good, right? So with that in mind, okay, another question. With that in mind, um, Jennifer, I know that you guys uh, do deep dives into these estimates. Let's break down this question into the multiple parts. First of all, can you talk more about this math and science behind the carbon sequestration estimates? Yes, so the approach that um, we take and others take, and I think is right in line with what you were talking about, Sevilla, is to look at you know, where is their consensus? So currently there's different ways to measure um, 
and there are, is some uncertainty about how much total carbon we could be talking about. But if you discount it to here, everybody agrees there's at least this much over a long period of time. So those are the two, the discounting and then the long-term view, getting away from that sort of annually, which can fluctuate more with rain in a particular, how much rainfall there was. So um, taking the long-term approach and really being conservative about how much carbon we think will be there enables you to move forward and, and get started and take that action and start causing, um, catalyzing that change. Because over the time, so the, um, over the decades that this will be in place, we will be modeling for year, three years, and then measuring and modeling and measuring and fixing that model over time. Hopefully, as you know, we're 10 years into this, we see that we can have greater certainty around even more amounts of carbon for this. But to, but to start, we are <laughs> limiting that certainty to a smaller portion of the amount of carbon, just to, um, yeah, to increase the certainty and be more conservative. And then I think there was also the question about the plateau. Um, lots of great debate on whether there is or is not a plateau. Um, Nicole Masters is one of the um, leaders in this space that we work with, and she always argues there is no plateau. Um, we, we imagine that there is one. It's sort of a what if, <laughs> and we model and anticipate that there is, again, you know, if the measurements show that the carbon is going up higher than initially anticipated, that would be fantastic. Um, but we, we add as one of our assumptions that there's a plateau that would be hit. I think that kind of falls into the category of like shoot for the stars and you may get the moon, but you still get the moon, right? <laughs> that's right. The so if we do hit a plateau, that's actually a great problem to have. I would love for us to reach that plateau. How about you? <laughs> yes, it's a good goal. Great. Great answer, thank you. And my friend, Joanne Brash from the California Product Stewardship Council. Great to hear from you, Joanne. She has a question. Do the panelists have examples of policies and legislation they have advocated for at the state or local levels? I can, I can answer that. And I would, it's a little bit of a punt, I guess. Um, we are members of series BICEP. Um, BICEP standing for Businesses for Innovative Environmental and Climate Policy um, and American Sustainable Business Council. And we really lean on um, particularly BICEP and Ceres for their climate policy knowledge to, um, to take on that role for us and advocate for us. So, um, we may um, get a letter around an initiative that um, series deems is important and ask us to sign on to it or go down to DC and advocate with uh, be an advocate um, on issues around climate with uh, certain senators or congressional representatives. So we'll go down and, and with other businesses and, and talk to folks. Um, so I would probably suggest I would put you in that direction to reach out to the series team or American Sustainable Business Council uh, to learn more from a deeper level of how they're thinking about it. I mean, for us, it's just that we believe in their expertise and we support what they're doing and we lend our voice to the policies that they're supporting. A little background behind Joanne. She works with the, I actually worked with her on a couple of projects um, before, and she works with the California Product Stewardship Council, which actually is an advocacy organization similar to the ones you mentioned, Jonah. Um, so she, she's probably familiar with those, but she's probably interested in the direct actions that any of us have taken. I know, Joanne, you're familiar with the work that Textile Exchange has been uh, trying to do to evolve policy at the federal level. Um, trying to uh, have some preferred tariffs for for textile products made with sustainable uh, materials. Um, I don't know, Jennifer, have you guys approached any state or federal level legislation? Um, we also do work through, as a benefit corporation and a B Corp, there's an advocacy group um, 
and which is in partnership with Sirius, as Shona is mentioning. Um, so we do work through that and it's in some, yeah, focused on climate um, at the moment. A lot of the change making that we aim to do also comes at the standards, the level of, of standards. And um, so we're active there as well. Well, that's great to hear. We don't have any current open questions. Um, please let us know if you have any questions. We do have a, a few more minutes for questions and then we're going to talk a little bit about the conference before we wrap it up. Um, but while we're looking for questions, I think um, the audience might find it a bit interesting. While we were setting up our webinar, some of us were discussing about some of our clothing. I know Jennifer and I are both wearing wool sweaters that we've had for over 20 years. And we were talking about the longevity of wool and how investing in a nice piece can actually inspire someone to keep it longer. I know that durability and longevity are two very hot topics in sustainability, um, designing for longevity, um, the price value paradigm that when a consumer spends a bit more on a piece, they're more likely to take care of it and keep it for longer. Um, also educating consumers about how to take care of things. Jennifer, do you want to tell us about your, your wool dress and the special uh, value it has for you? Yes, I got it when I was living in Sweden and I remember it seeming so terribly expensive at the time, but that was in 2002 and I'm still glad to be to be sporting it today. So well-made and well-designed products do add value and wool being a being a value-added fiber a bit expensive already. Um, wool, cashmere, alpaca, uh, these fibers um, the longevity of the garment when made from a good fiber to begin with can really add to its use and its and its value to not only the customer but also um, by reducing the other garments that that consumer might have had to buy had that garment uh, fallen apart quicker or um, worn out faster. So wool being one of the strongest fibers that we know of um, also has antimicrobial properties, uh, water resistant, um, mold resistant. There are many great properties that wool as a fiber has that when taken care of properly can really extend the life of the garment. And that's one of the things that while it falls outside the scope of textile exchange, it's certainly something that we acknowledge is a very important contributor to uh, reducing overall consumption. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. Um, the stat that comes into my mind, and I don't know how accurate it is, but it's, it's like the 80-20 rule. Mm. You actually probably only wear about 20% of what's in your closet. There are, I guarantee for most of the people that are with us today, there are probably a few key pieces, particularly during COVID when you're at home, right, that you just go to and you it's comfortable, it's, um, it's, it just feels right and you like it, it expresses who you are as a person and you go back to those pieces again and again and again. Yeah. And so while you might have a whole load, a big walk-in closet with all sorts of things in it, um, my guess is most of us are really keep going after those kind of, the, I'll say investment pieces, but those pieces that are, are your favorites. You have favorites. We all have favorites. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, I'll ask this question, Shona and Jennifer, can you, I know you guys did a really great in-depth detailed um, presentation about the project that you're collaborating on. Um, what are you seeing as some of the side benefits of the program, or is it a little too early to tell? Like unexpected benefits that you wouldn't have thought of going in, but that you're starting to see develop and that are impressing you. Jennifer, I might see if you have a thought on this. Yes, definitely um, working with Ovis 21 and, you know, different projects, we're always working with different local partners. In this case, it's Ovis 21. They already had goals that they were working to reach. Um, in this case, they're looking to involve more uh, growers in their EOV, the ecological outcome verification um, that Savory does. So as 
um, was alluded to at the beginning of the presentation, there's some growers that are on that path. You know, they've been doing these things, keen to adopt um, EOV as part of Ovis 21's program. And then there's a, you know, a, a next group, which is interested, but facing these barriers. So in collaboration with Ovis 21, we were able to say, well, exactly what barriers and who, um, and how can, you know, is there a role for, for this, an initiative like this to help? So the work has the benefit of taking this climate action in a robust and way that can be measured and verified uh, over a really long period of time, as well as helping Ovis 21 advance a larger group um, of growers on a path to some goals that they had, had set out for other reasons. So there's a lot of synergies there. And I would just say that in general, um, you know, that bringing on, bringing together a number of um, local actors, both those early actors who've been at this for a while and those who are maybe waiting in the wings, interested but not started, um, is a really a key benefit of, of working in this really community focused, making it about the people and the community. Um, it's a great approach. Shona, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Now, I don't think so, except that you guys know, you know, we've been with TE for a long, long time and, and Native Energy. You, you, you find this alignment among stakeholders and the synergies just, it's like a ripple effect, you know, you, you throw your pebble in the pond and it just expands outward and you start to see other connections. And um, I feel like whenever we get involved in a project like this, we see that and how things can build on it. And it, somehow it always catches us by surprise, but um, in another way, it's just like, ah, you know, doing good is, is, is great for the environment. It's great for the communities. And there's a business component to it that um, just seems to work. And so, yeah, it's, it's just always nice to meet all these awesome people when you get involved with these types of projects. Yeah, this is a bit of halo effect, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have a couple of questions here for Jennifer. We have uh, one, could you please have the email address for Jennifer? Um, uh, this is, I think we need to type it into the box because it's an anonymous attendee, so we don't have their email to reply directly. But if Jennifer, if you can type in your email address there for them. Sure. And then Malvina also has a question for you. Jennifer, you mentioned regenerative is only a small portion of farming practices. Are you looking to add more farmers or farm groups? And if so, how and in what way? Yes, more farmers or farm groups to this program or to other programs. Is that the, oh, I guess you wouldn't know. So, yeah, you're just, <laughs> so yes, we are always putting out a call for interest to, um, to two groups, so um, three groups, farms, growers, ranchers themselves, um, cooperatives or you know other collectives that are um, representing groups of farmers and then also uh, experts so in a region people with expertise in um, regenerative but not necessarily that narrow but more those local organizations that are support networks for farmers and growers because those are all the pieces you know needed to make to figure this out and connect the dots and make something um, meaningful happen on the ground in the different in the different regions around the world. So um, yes, we're always looking for more farms. I hope that answers your question. Great. And with that, in the last few minutes that we have, I'm going to tell everyone a bit about our conference, upcoming conference. Um, this year, it's a virtual, like many conferences. Uh, we're all learning how to how to evolve in this new COVID world. So very, we're actually very excited to have our conference this year being on uh, on a virtual platform. Our keynote speaker, Alexander Cousteau, uh, it will be held November second through the sixth. 
You can find more information on our website, textilexchange.org slash 2020 conference. Uh, we'll be looking at biodiversity, climate action, circularity, transparency, standards and certifications, preferred fiber materials, and more. Uh, we also still have exhibit booths still available. It's going to be mm -hmm. very interesting. And on one of the, let's see, one of the questions that came through was about the round tables. So we do have several that may be of interest to people on this call. The first is going to be a general animal fibers and materials round table that will tee up the subsequent round tables for those specific fibers. Um, so we encourage everyone, if you have an interest in an animal fiber and material, to please join this one first, and then the subsequent ones focusing on each individual fiber. That one will be held December 7th. You can find more information on our website, again, uh, at the events tab in the 2020 conference. And this roundtable will set the frame for specific roundtables that will focus on the fibers and materials. The responsible alpaca, wool, and mohair roundtable will be December 17th. Um, and that roundtable is intended to guide and support the respective associated standards. This group is comprised of stakeholders across the industry, including brands, retailers, suppliers, producers, animal welfare experts, and land management experts. And again, we encourage you to join the first animal uh, welfare webinar first, which will re be related to this one. And we thank you for your time. Uh, we will be sending out the slide deck. Uh, I don't think we have any unanswered questions, so no, no need for follow-up there. I think we were able to address them all, which is great. Um, and thank you for your time. Thanks for joining us. We'll be sending out the recording within 48 hours. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you to our speakers, and thank you for participating in today's webinar. As a friendly reminder, as Sylvia mentioned, we will be sending out an email with the links to today's presentation. To all of the registered participants, that concludes our webinar. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.